Well, hello everyone. This is Data Driven Formula One with Patrick Hansen, Ghana for Grebner. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Ghana. Hello, all. Nice to be back with a fascinating topic, I think. Yeah, so today we're talking about uh, Walter Wolf Racing. And so, uh, yeah, very interesting uh, uh, yeah, competitor in Formula One and generally uh, in terms of strategy, also very interesting company. Exactly. Interesting team, uh, fascinating uh, driver, and uh, maybe you recognize the one already in the photo. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, Walter Wolf, uh, an uh, interesting uh, character. So we just, I think, cover all of these different uh, topics. Yeah, I guess we need to also issue warning for, well, several warnings, right, right uh, up front. <laughs> so uh, if you are absolutely uh, like a hater of cigarettes, we, we will be demonstrating some, obviously, because of the name uh, Walter, of Walter Wolf. Well, we cannot avoid that. That's just what the company, yeah. you know, um, did and, and does. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, again, just to kind of um, uh, remind everyone that uh, we are essentially, uh, Patrick and I essentially, like the whole, this whole series is kind of like a, yeah. a like more, more like a podcast rather than a, um, you know, a video series. So we only demonstrate yeah. material that uh, we know we can demonstrate legally. Um, so either shared freely on CC by license or uh, we know that this kind of has open license um, and or we, we purchased, right? So we actually have rights to show. So if you're expecting kind of flashy movies, that's probably not what you're going to see in yeah. this series. So I just kind of want to um, issue that warning uh, in advance. But yeah, our main base is uh, YouTube and Spotify, where we are in video format and uh, on uh, many other platforms we are in the form of a podcast. But everyone yeah. is welcome. And um, like we, we always say that, you know, please uh, subscribe and um, kind of hit the uh, the bell so that you get notifications when we post uh, new episodes. And of course, uh, we're always looking for feedback. So if you see something that we missed, or if you have some ideas for uh, new episodes for us, please let us know. We always want to know that. Yeah, you have a good point. So you may say we are practically an augmented audio podcast. Yeah, Mostly exactly. us talking, but sh but showing various uh, images uh, as the one uh, which you see right at the moment. If you're with us uh, at YouTube or Spotify, and uh, one important uh, point about Walter Wolf uh, Racing, um, and we will come uh, to this uh, later when we speak about the cigarettes. That the design is a, uh, what we would call in marketing uh, me too. Maybe typical colors uh, which made the Lotus team famous, black uh, with gold. So uh, it's, uh, uh, and uh, we will come back to this when yeah. we speak about uh, cigarettes. Yeah, we also have uh, two uh, episodes on uh, tobacco sponsorships and Formula One. So if you want to know more about that topic, uh, please have a look at our video archive uh, and, or audio yeah. archive and you will find uh, two episodes about Big Tobacco and Formula One where we discuss various companies and show you a lot of different photos of cars and uh, some designs are quite fascinating. Yes, I including uh, the black and gold, which normally is more uh, related to uh, Lotus with the famous uh, John Spear Special Library. Yeah, but let's right. come uh, to the person uh, behind, uh, which is uh, Walter Wolf, which is uh, his uh, real name. He's a Canadian uh, oil equipment supplier uh, who made it in the early 1970s uh, a fortune thanks to this uh, business. He was born in Austria, in uh, Graz, uh, so you would spell it Walter Wolf. Uh, October 5 in, uh, uh, in uh, 39, but uh, he became a nationalized uh, Canadian, responsible, of course, for his own uh, team, where they had 48 entries, 
and uh, fascinating, uh, outstanding for such a small team. They even had three victories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we will discuss, uh, obviously, the management of the team. And again, we um, uh, want to to remind you that, uh, of course, you know, e e when we talk about, for example, tobacco sponsorships, I mean, currently we yeah. just told you that Walter Wolf was oil, um, uh, yeah. oil entrepreneur, but uh, Walter Wolf has obviously, has obviously done cigarettes. You know, we can, um, of course, uh, you know, we, we, we are, of course, against any, you know, um, consumption of cigarettes. However, uh, you have to understand that uh, uh, without big tobacco, the history of Formula One would have been completely different. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a that's fact. Right. That's right, yes. Yeah. So uh, there we see him in a little bit uh, younger age, maybe end of 70s or beginning of 80s, I would uh, assume based on this uh, style. So again, he was born uh, in Austria, uh, uh, son uh, to a uh, Swabian, meaning uh, uh, his father came from the south of uh, Germany and his uh, mother from uh, Slovenia. But, yeah, uh, and, and we probably again, should have explain. Yeah, we probably since we have Patrick with us, so we can probably explain yeah. what is, uh, you know, Schweben and Schwabish. Yeah, sh sh uh, and so basically there is a separate dialect. Of, well, German language has many dialects. One of them yeah. is, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, Schwabish or Schwabish? Schwabish, yeah. Schwabish, yeah. Schwabish. And uh, it is very difficult to understand even for like, you know, I, I lived in Austria um, uh, for several years and I went to university in Austria, but I <laughs> cannot, <laughs> I cannot tell <laughs> what people are saying yeah. in that dialect. So it, it just kind of looks like nothing else. Um, and yeah, so, but it's, it's kind of very relatively small area, right? And, uh, the, but uh, it has a separate dialect. Correct. It's in the south, uh, in the region of uh, Baden-Württemberg. So the most uh, famous city would be uh, Stuttgart. Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, of course, famous in motorsports for Porsche and uh, Mercedes-Benz. Uh, uh, also uh, important to mention, and uh, because this also uh, because it influenced uh, strongly his uh, character. Uh, the reason why uh, his father came from one country and his mother from another company, company is, of course, uh, still the Second uh, World War, where people had to live uh, uh, before the war, in the war, and uh, after the war, due uh, to the different um, political blocks forming then after the Second World War. So this, of course, had a strong uh, impact uh, on his parents, especially his uh, mother. And we will come uh, to this later, uh, but also, of course, uh, himself with a strong focus on the, the need uh, to make uh, money. Because when you are a ref refugee, uh, one of the things you are lacking is uh, mostly uh, money and uh, financial stability. So I think this uh, strongly influenced him as a person. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think um, we've we've seen a lot of really rich boys <laughs> in this series. <laughs> yes. I mean, he's definitely not one of those, um, and you know, he also was very talented in sports, right? So he um, yes. uh, actually did a lot of sports, and uh, I think that kind of helped him also to in in, in life and in his career a lot. Of yeah. course. Uh... Yeah, of, of course, it helps you for to develop a competitive uh, character. Uh, so quite uh, fast, interesting. Uh, he participated at the Olympic Winter Games in Innsbruck, Austria, but not for Austria, but for his uh, new home country, Canada. Canada. Yeah. So that also helps uh, normally with citizenship if you can really compete at that level. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, we've uh, kind of, if you've been to Innsbruck and, uh, you know, I, I lived there and kind of studied in, in the university uh, as well. And you s sort of, you can still see that uh, this uh, <laughs> infamous <laughs> uh, 
uh, downhill thing. So yeah, it it, it looks pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <whole> slope <laughs> and the olympic park itself is absolutely amazing i think they're constantly renovating it and now it looks uh, looks really great yeah yeah um just to add due to my knowledge uh, in regarding olympics uh, you don't have to start uh, for the country where you have your cities from especially in winter olympics i remember various times that people that athletes who had been unhappy with their A local organization uh, went to, to another one, for example, Austrians or Germans starting for Luxembourg because they had problems with their local organization. So it's not uh, mandatory that you start for the country where oh, no, no. you have your um, citizenship from. Yeah, sorry, let me rephrase that. I think when you are an athlete uh, and when you yeah. can compete at, uh, at Olympic level, Or you can play for a national team, you know. So when you're at, at that high level of, yeah. uh, you, be, you know, and being really uh, kind of uh, capable of bringing some medals to uh, the national team, I think it just speeds up your citizenship yes. application. <laughs> so yeah, generally exactly. helps. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a little bit like if you... Uh, you know, in, in especially in the States, we see that a lot, right? If you're a, a very talented athlete, it, it helps yeah. you to get into a good college. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of similar situation. Yeah, that, that's right. And this is opposite to Europe, where universities normally don't uh, sponsor you if you are a good uh, sportsman. For example, yeah, in sure. Germany, uh, what many athletes do, uh, they go for a couple of years uh, to the army because the army has a special department for athletes where they not really get the combat training but just focus on the sports and uh, something which in opposite uh, we don't have in the us if i'm uh, correct and just uh, to agree uh, especially in, in sports uh, where everybody's interested in as uh, football or soccer as they call it in the us uh, here uh, You have to have the citizenship to play for your team, um, if I'm not completely wrong. And here, of course, it really supports the process of getting such papers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's uh, return to Walter and his uh, business uh, career. So he started as a contractor in the uh, oil business Initially supplied drill bits for oil production systems, at times employed over 300 uh, divers to look for new oil deposits. Yeah, yeah, we just, uh, I, I just wanted to, to say, sorry, Patrick, that he started actually as a building, right? Uh, because his, his, yeah. uh, his father was a builder. He initially started exactly. as a builder as well, because simply because, you know, that's what his father did. But then, as Patrick said uh, absolutely correctly, he quickly saw an opportunity in the oil market, and we all know that that's a very good idea. <laughs> and it has been for many years. And, of course, I think in the 80s there was a crisis, right, with oil. But, um, you know, mostly, you know... Oh, we, we even have it on screen. There was a first in 1973, yeah. 1974, but then in the 80s, we also had the crisis. But, but overall, it's a pretty good uh, business to be in. Uh, and, uh, you know, yeah. he saw that very early on and that helped him to kind of, um, you know, elevate himself uh, from uh, the position of a builder to uh, 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 the position of business owner in oil business. Exactly. And uh, I think one of his uh, key strengths uh, had been to identify opportunities and uh, his ability for networking because he saw the opportunity in the oil business. Uh, he came in contact with important people in uh, Saudi Arabia and other regions and uh, he met them and uh, had been able to maintain close contact with these political figures plus uh, other political figures all around uh, the world and become, uh, of course, to this also a little bit later in today's episode. But I think one of his really uh, strengths and uh, uh, which helped him uh, uh, to uh, gain um, uh, this uh, position of power and money was really his ability of networking. 
Yeah, and um, uh, Patrick, as you mentioned, uh, because his family was in, practically in financial hardship, he, like yeah. f f from a very early age, he learned this uh, this ability to communicate and negotiate. And essentially, yeah, he was very good at, uh, um, you know, this entrepreneurial activity. And this yeah. this what essentially helped him to... Um, to become successful in this business, because as as we all understand, the uh, oil business, especially when you are starting at, at the level uh, at which uh, Walter Wolf sta sta started, that yeah. you need quite a lot of luck and uh, knowledge of the you know no basically knowledge of where you can find oil, and obviously yeah. that's again uh, very much dependent on communication and ability to. Uh, entrepreneurially uh, analyze information and that you know that's the skill that he learned throughout his childhood and uh, it's quite impressive that he uh, um, managed to you know practically without any you know starting capital or anything get uh, to to uh, a very prominent position in that business Correct. Uh, this is what he learned uh, himself in the um, in the time after Second World War, and also this was directly uh, introduced uh, into him uh, by his parents, especially his mother, who always underlined uh, that uh, the world is all about uh, money. Let's uh, jump to 1975, as it's not untypical for the 1970s uh, up to today is that uh, rich people looking, are looking for new toys. Uh, we had several business leaders uh, who started having their uh, own team. We even have this uh, today. I mean, the same other rich people try to fly into space. Others buy a, a team inside Format 1 or buy a a football club in France, UK, whatever. So rich people looking for new toys. And this was also the case for Walter Wolf as he acquired 60% of the financial struggling Frank Williams racing team, uh, including that he kept uh, its owner, Frank Williams, a team, uh, team manager. Yeah, I mean, we will talk. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for when we're going to talk about uh, Frank Williams. Uh, this fascinating, absolutely fascinating yeah. character and really very remarkable team. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that it was not just, uh, you know, a toy because, again, uh, the person we're talking about is a very entrepreneurial person, right? And he, from some from very early uh, stages of this, he understood that you know Formula One was on the rise. It was a great uh, yeah. advertising opportunity, and uh, we need to also remind you of political landscape. So Patrick and I have, have already yes. talked about 1970s and how, you know, th this is the time when um, um, uh, Formula One can really became this really professional sport, right? And uh, it was um, very, very much uh, uh, supported by various politicians. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not only, you know, that, that it's, it's cute and nice to have, <laughs> to have some partnership with uh, um, the Formula One and you're probably looking pretty cool for it, but also this, is, this was kind of the door into television, televised um, advertisement and uh, you know politi you know pol politicians very often attend these events and of course if you are mm -hmm. uh, if you are team team owner you are most likely are going to uh, <laughs> to see them and meet them and uh, so I think this is a great also networking opportunity for the business and of course it costs money on the one hand but on the other hand there are also benefits um, and I think as a as an entrepreneurial person, Walter Wolf definitely saw these opportunities. And again, the engagement was not purely uh, because, you know, he liked Formula One, but also because uh, this was a good investment or he saw it as a good investment. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you have a very good uh, point here, especially in 1970s, uh, everybody was really uh, involved into Formula One and it was the big thing. Maybe it, lo it lost a little bit 
as I said, rich people maybe prefer now flying into space than uh, being around Formula One. But it, I think in 1970s, it was uh, a little, still a little bit bigger than today, including that it was uh, all rich people all over the world, including uh, politicians and other key uh, decision makers had been attracted uh, uh, to the sports, including, of course, uh, would, would be a great gift, uh, get, uh, get good uh, and great opportunity to invite uh, important people to talk uh, with them around uh, the weekends. So, yeah, uh, many politicians really like yeah. cars, right, as well. Yeah. So, yes. yeah, and collect them. And yeah, so this is, yes. again, an opportunity to be, you know, to be out there and really make uh, uh, make uh, a lot of benefit out of this type of advertisement. Yes. And uh, how, however this is, I mean, uh, he was practically uh, very successful in all uh, what he started and the same uh, with this team. So he kept uh, Frank Williams as the team manager in the beginning. Uh, he kept uh, Harvey Postleways, Postlewaite, uh, I hope I spell it right, as uh, the chief designer, uh, uh, which he acquired together with other parts from the former... Uh, Heskes uh, team, including uh, using the old Heskes car. And we, if you saw our episode on Heskes, um, practically Walter Wolf bought uh, big parts of the team and other parts of the team uh, continued uh, as Heskes, um, but it's practically it wasn't the same as in the time with James Hunt and uh, Lord Heskes. Yeah, so they also had those. We remember when we discussed 1970s, we told you about the um, air, uh, yeah, air traffic uh, accident uh, with Graham Hill and his team, mm -hmm. and yeah, they had also some uh, some equipment from Embassy Hill, yes. basically. Yeah, and that's probably I don't know how it how it came to him, but how it came to Walter Wolf. But I'm guessing again through Frank Williams, probably <laughs> con yeah. considering considering the industrious nature of <laughs> of, yeah. of Williams um, uh, as a personality and as a team. So yeah, I think uh, um, I think that's probably where it came from. So, um, yeah, so, so it was uh, one of those smaller teams, of course, but at the same time, like Patrick said, it's, uh, you know, you have to, um, you have to understand that it's very difficult to compete with uh, large um, teams like Ferrari, for example. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, this team managed to achieve three wins, as we told you at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. But not without uh, any uh, frictions, uh, because um, Walter Wolf, as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, he understood uh, the need to restructure the former Frank Williams team. Uh, logical, I mean, the team was financially struggling. It wasn't that successful. It was by far not what uh, Williams became uh, later on. So logically that he identified the need for change, which... Uh, caused uh, frictions uh, with uh, Frank Williams uh, and also with its uh, head of engineering, uh, Patrick uh, Head. So uh, they left uh, later uh, Walter Wolf uh, Racing and would uh, found what we know up, uh, what we know still today as the Williams Racing team. Right, and, but I also think that you know Frank Williams probably lo learned a lot from the experience we <laughs> will talk about when sure. we talk about Frank Williams, because yeah, I think uh, so. So Frank Williams's background is me mechanic, right? So he is um, uh, he's uh, he never studied mecha mechanical engineering as far as, as far as I know, but he was a mechanic, uh, like practical mechanic. And very, uh, very, very talented, obviously, in this. And um, I think initially when he got into this business, he just thought that he can make good cars. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, um, uh, Formula One is obviously not just making a good car, but managing the whole process around it, right? And uh, we discussed a lot of examples when people were very talented designers, but they couldn't really manage the team and it didn't work. Uh, in the end. So, um, so I guess, uh, yeah, so on the one hand, yes, of course, I didn't, um, 
uh, they didn't see eye to eye ultimately, and I can imagine why because uh, m- m- uh, my my take on Walter Wolf he probably was quite um, uh, controlling, right? Uh, so I think that that probably what what was going on, and it's also very difficult to work when you had your own team and then all of a sudden you're becoming you know from entrepreneur you're transferring to employee <laughs> so that's yeah. a little bit uh, that's a little bit difficult just uh, psychologically and uh, yeah i mean but it uh, i would argue that you know f- uh, frank williams actually learned learned a lot and when he went to organize his own team even though he disagreed of course with walter wolf uh, uh, when they work together, I think there is a lot of this organizational magic that he picked up from 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 the guy, and you know, uh, he obviously Frank Williams did it in his own way, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, you know, the business side of it was uh, changed uh, from from what it used to be. Yeah, and uh, we will analyze, of course, this in a special uh, episode about uh, Frank Williams. Just uh, to add, uh, uh, besides this, uh, Frank Williams was also a great uh, motivator. Um, that's why he could uh, get uh, Patrick Head and also other employees from Walter Wolf Racing to leave Wolf uh, in 77 and to uh, start a new adventure, which was Williams, uh, of course, at the end of the 1970s. Uh, to finalize just the financial point uh, with uh, uh, Frank Williams leaving, uh, Walter Wolf uh, bought the uh, still uh, 40% of the shares which Frank still had at that time. So also Frank Williams had uh, then the enough uh, financial resources to start a new team. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it, that's, that's also kind of uh, something that uh, helped, I think. Williams team. Yeah. Whose date was uh, Harvey Postelweiss, very talented uh, engineer, designer, uh, which he already approved uh, with uh, the Heskes, which was a very good uh, design, especially uh, for a small car, not too progressive in opposite uh, to Lotus, but a, a conventional car with a conventional Cosmos motor, which uh, worked especially good uh, if you're not uh, in one of the top teams, but in one of the smaller teams where you have to have uh, an eye um, on the budget. So his design wasn't too progressive, just uh, right. And uh, with this uh, combined with a very good uh, driver, as uh, Jody Schechter was coming from uh, Terrell, they had been very successful in the 1977 season. Yeah, so George Schechter was second, right after yeah. uh, after Nicky Lauda in 1977. So and and yeah, so the notable wins were the Monaco Grand Prix and the Canadian Grand Prix. Especially, you know, we yeah. we uh, we saw the the Monaco Grand Prix and how difficult that that track yeah. is. <laughs> Uh, we, we constantly we, we keep telling you that it's it's uh, one of uh, probably the most difficult uh, tracks uh, there are. That 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 uh, that we have in Formula One, and uh, yeah, so um, uh, I guess uh, one of the uh, you know one of the main advantages uh, of uh, Walter Walter Wolf team at that time, and we we keep uh, I guess uh, citing uh, Enzo Ferrari yeah. here as pe- uh, people, right? So he managed to, yeah, exactly. uh, and and that's quite remarkable because as we as we told you, you know, he lost Frank Williams, but nevertheless he managed to attract, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a really great talent um, mm-hmm. uh, to the team and uh, pull off this uh, second place in 1977. Exactly, and even if it was a very small team, uh, they even uh, decided uh, to start in parallel in the uh, Canem uh, racing series for sports cars here in the US and in uh, Canada. For this, they commissioned Italian uh, company uh, Dallara to design a car, which you see on this photo, which Mm -hmm. I had the pleasure uh, to take myself. Uh, Ghana and I, we like to underline on a regular basis, I think, to visit uh, museums, the big ones, 
but also always a big uh, recommendation, the small private collections, which are organized uh, by somebody uh, who's very passionate uh, on the topic. So here I had the pleasure to visit the Gilles Villeneuve Museum very near the city of Montreal, on the way from Montreal to uh, Quebec. Uh, so if you're ever there, I would highly recommend this small but very nice collection, which includes uh, the uh, Wolf Dallara WD1 driven by uh, Jill Veneuf. Yeah, brilliant. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and you can see the, the, the similarity yeah. with, the, with the previous two photos uh, in terms of design. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, it was fast. Um, it was driven besides Jill Veneuf, uh, also with the other, another uh, former Ferrari driver, Chris uh, Ammon. It was a, a fast car, unfortunately, um, it never had the reliability, meaning it never finished uh, the races. The only uh, time it finished, it was at uh, Road America uh, on a third uh, position. But most of the other races, unfortunately, it never finished. And uh, here, uh, I think the problem may have been that the team uh, was uh, too small to really have uh, success in Formula One and in the Can-Am series. Yeah, it's just a different uh, type of design that you need, right, for 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 each of these. And I guess if yes. your priority is to make Formula One cars, then you kind of, I mean, this one is already, uh, this effort would not get enough investment. And, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, it, it, it's difficult if you have a small team to do that. Yeah. And uh, Gilles Veneuve, uh, of course, uh, here the Canadian uh, connection, uh, practically an all, well, the car was designed in Italy, but uh, an all Canadian team. And also uh, Gilles Veneuve at the end of the 1970s had the offer to change from Ferrari to uh, the Walter Wolf team, which we know uh, he declined as he stayed uh, with uh, Ferrari. Oh. Going to the next year, unfortunately, uh, uh, 77, this was uh, the best year. Uh, they couldn't uh, keep it up uh, on that high level, but still uh, quite uh, good, again, for such a small uh, team. Again, Postulate produced uh, the car, this time including ground effects, as everybody in 1978 copied uh, from uh, Lotus. Uh, Jody Schechter finished fourth in Spain, second in uh, Germany, uh, switching from the VR5, then later to the VR6, the update. Um, well, still quite good, seventh position for him, but not, not that uh, groundbreaking as besides as the year before. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's... Um... I think, well, we we keep reiterating this point, but it's very difficult to produce uh, uh, steady results in Formula One because the technology changes so fast and uh, you need to constantly be ahead of the game. And uh, Patrick and I already showed you many examples when it was a champion team and the next season they didn't perform well, right? Yes. So it, it is not uncommon to to have the, those problems and of course um, it's a good test for any team to see whether they can keep up then with the competition when that happens yeah and uh, then uh, the next year uh, walter wolf had the problem as many smaller teams uh, have when after one or two years because the big teams with the big budgets of course uh, they are looking at you and uh, and if they see talent, uh, they come with the final attractive uh, offers like uh, driving for Ferrari or just uh, uh, money and uh, they lure people away from you. And again, it is understandable, let's say, that so the director saw that Walter Wolf uh, could not offer him a car where he could compete to accept the offer. And uh, so this is what he did. And... Uh, as we know, uh, Jolly Jackter drove 1979 for the Scuderia Ferrari and uh, gained the championship with Ferrari. 
Uh, in return, uh, the team received uh, another former champion, uh, James uh, Hunt, um, who had been at um, McLaren at that time, uh, who was uh, struggling uh, there. And uh, that's why he thought maybe McLaren for sure uh, cannot offer me a uh, good car. Maybe I gamble and go to Wald, uh, Wolf Racing. If you saw the movie um, Rush, Nicky Lauda said somewhere at the end that he wasn't motivated anymore. Uh, but uh, maybe I would not uh, completely agree here with Lauda because even if you are still motivated, but you you're not sitting in the right car at the right moment, uh, you cannot win uh, races or championships. And uh, and uh, Hunt didn't have the opportunity, let's say, to go to Lotus or to Ferrari. So he gambled, went to Walter Wolf Racing, and it not really worked out for him. Yeah, and also I think if you've given up and uh, sort of uh, you're plan just planning just planning to retire, then you wouldn't change the car. You, yeah. you would, you know, you would stay where you are and probably not do much. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, but, um, uh, he can't was... retire. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So when it was so, not working out uh, really well, he did retire. Mm. Yeah, he had to understood uh, that he gambled and it not really worked out. And uh, I think he had not any opportunities to go to another team. So that's why he took the decision mid-season to retire from Formula One in, say, uh, in general. So in 1979, we had uh, both retire uh, Nicky Lauda relatively at the end from Brabham and then uh, James Hunt a little bit earlier from uh, Walter Wolf uh, Racing. Interesting uh, here, because uh, he was replaced by a future champion, uh, Keke Rosberg, uh, whom you can also see here on the photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, if we look at uh, the history of the team, then uh, uh, Walter Wolf decided to also kind of sell the team, right? So he yeah. quit the sport and uh, the team got sold to Emerson Fittipaldi and again yeah. you know this is uh, really this is really interesting how like uh, 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 Walter Wolf really had a very good uh, intuition for talent because yeah. if we look at this na these names you know George Schechter, James yeah. Hunt, Kiki Rosberg again like yeah. it was it's not like a random set of names that uh, you know you would not remember um, and even you know like when he had this these assets uh, on the books he also sold them to uh, to to someone good who he knew would care about these things because it's I think it's uh, for any person involved in Formula One you know for us it's not personal because we are watching well I know for some fans it's very personal let me take that back but uh, yeah uh, I, I think it's very very <coughs> personal for for team owner to make sure that uh, you know your car is in a good um, in in good hands your cars are in good hands yeah. yeah. Yeah, the car and of course also the uh, the team members, the, the team the members itself. Yeah. And uh, to add, uh, he not only attracted very talented uh, drivers, but had also a very intelligent uh, designer, with Harvey yeah, Postelweg. Designer. So he really had uh, key people uh, on the different uh, positions, which uh, gave him the uh, success in the first year. But maybe due to a limited uh, budget. Uh, uh, the team uh, couldn't uh, grow further. Yeah, and I think it just uh, also was a, a little bit, uh, like I said, it, this is a big test for any team. You have some, either you do not have success, but in this case they had uh, success pretty early on. But then, you know, you, you kind of, the fate starts testing you because yeah. the car ultimately next year, you your car becomes not so good because now the competitors know what you're doing. Yeah. And um, yeah, the, the, the whole sports uh, sport uh, moves really fast. And I think it's a little bit difficult for the person who is in uh, traditional business, right? Oil business, yeah. or even cigarette business, because 
those businesses do not change. The industry does not change yes. very quickly uh, compared to uh, to Formula One, where you know everything changes in a matter of uh, one race. <laughs> you can completely be be in a, in a completely different car as a result of you know some engineering enhancements and things like that. And of course, yeah, the uh, you know we, it it's not. Um, surprising that uh, the car didn't live um, a long life but at the same time we need to understand that that's just maybe if he stuck a little bit longer with it he would have you know received some uh, some benefits but i think he just himself got a little bit frustrated with how quickly things change right and you are losing drivers you are losing team members and uh, yeah, it, it is difficult, and uh, because it's so fast, it's not it's mm. not for everyone this this business. Yeah, and maybe because due to his uh, other businesses, he was uh, used to it to have uh, success. So maybe he, he wasn't used to various years with uh, limited uh, success. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's why uh, that's this motivated him too. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. I think uh, the businesses, the businesses that he had, they are relatively quickly uh, bringing rewards, right? Uh, in terms of like oil, is almost instant. You yeah. just sort of sell it, and 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 and, and that's uh, th that's it. And the cigarettes as well. And and if we look at Formula One, you know, if it didn't uh, pay off for two years uh, straight, then you're already thinking, yeah, maybe. You know, maybe it's time to just uh, close it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Speaking a little bit about the technology which they had been using, uh, being in Formula One from 1976 for until 79. So the first year they they uh, they practically bore, bought part of the Eskes team and they bought the uh, existing car, uh, the Eskes 308C, uh, which they renamed to. Uh, FW05, Frank Williams. The driver, uh, also here, interesting names. Uh, of course, Jackie X, and sometimes together with Arturo Messario, Renzo Sassi, Michel Leclerc, uh, Leclerc, Chris Amon, Hans Binder, Masani, Kubasami. In general, uh, the strategy which they used for all uh, of that time is to focus on just one driver. Uh, who really had been the one who should compete and sometimes uh, aligned with a second uh, pay driver to bring in some additional money, but really the team focused strongly on one driver. And besides this, if it was a smaller team, but they really had uh, quite, uh, they had been quite fast with uh, offering updates. So in 77, they used three different versions, the Wolf, WR123. Next year, they used even four versions, 1356. Of course, the older versions mostly used by their uh, pay driver in 78, uh, Bobby Rahal, who uh, became quite famous in the IndyCar series. And uh, also, and this will be another story, was the one who tested the potential uh, Ferrari Indianapolis car later in the 1980s. And then uh, last year, we had uh, James Hunt and uh, future champion Kike Rosberg. But unfortunately, even if they had used three different uh, car designs, uh, two uh, champions, zero points for the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is uh, what uh, you mentioned. Uh, look look just at the, these names. Uh, yeah, the lineup. <laughs> look lineup. at the lineup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, three world champions. Uh, unfortunately, never with uh, Walter Wolf, uh, Walter Wolf uh, racing itself, but nevertheless, uh, uh, great uh, talent uh, up as, uh, besides uh, uh, Harvey Bosselwald as a designer, Frank Williams, Patrick Head, uh, who had been in included at least in the beginning. So really a big number of talent in this uh, small Canadian um, team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, and this uh, speaks to the ability to pick uh, the right people, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that's yeah. uh, uh, that's really important ability, especially in Formula One, where everything depends on team effort. Yeah. 
And of course, uh, his ability for networking, I think, also helped him here to get these people inside uh, your team. Um, uh, now, let's say in the second part of this episode, we want to speak a little bit about uh, other, other aspects of Walter Wolf's uh, life. Uh, not really surprising, he liked uh, fast uh, cars. He had uh, the budget to not only uh, buy a normal uh, Lamborghini Countach, but uh, he wasn't really satisfied with the car's uh, engine. He wanted to have a stronger engine. And that's why he asked uh, Gianpaolo Dallara, the chef engineer at Lamborghini at that time, and later the founder of uh, Dallara. Remember, uh, they should work together later for the Can-Am series. So he asked uh, Gianpaolo Dallara, to create a special uh, version of the Countach with a higher powered uh, engine and some other small uh, changes in the design of the car. And uh, Lamborghini um, um, accepted this and uh, produced three special Walter Wolf Countach. I don't know if all three of them still exist, uh, but at least uh, one Yes, and this is the one which you see on the photo. I would assume that the, also the other two still exist. As I mentioned, people uh, take uh, good care of such uh, their cars. Yeah, looks uh, really lamborghini -ish. but I'm sure, yes. uh, I'm sure there are some features inside that probably are not Lamborghini. Wow. Yes, if I'm... Uh, uh, I don't know if I mix it up maybe with the Colani Ferrari. I'm not sure if uh, the steering wheel had the Walter Wolf logo. I think yes. So it, so if you sit inside, you don't see the... Uh, Lamborghini. The Toro. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but outside, uh, it, it uh, definitely uh, is a signature Lamborghini look, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's the Countach. I mean, this is the car which looks most uh, Lamborghini uh, of all, which have been produced more than 20 years uh, from 70s to 90s. Uh, so, I mean, this car is as Lamborghini as it gets, plus it has a stronger engine and some other changes in uh, detail. Yeah, um, and here's, here's the controversial, the mo we come to the most controversial slide of the of this yeah. uh, discussion. <laughs> I, I, maybe I would disagree that this is the most controversial, <laughs> is, but anyway. Well, it's, yeah. a, it's cigarettes, that's what I mean, and, and this is uh, mm -hmm. the warning that I issued at the, at the beginning. Yeah. That, well, Walter, we cannot... <laughs> avoid the topic of cigarettes when we discuss Walter Wolf and definitely this is again uh, part of the business of Walter Wolf and uh, what you see on the right hand side if you're watching us on video either on YouTube or on Spotify you can see kind of the old design of Walter Wolf uh, cigarettes and uh, on the left hand side and smaller sort of picture you see the current one or most most yep. recent one that, that we could find anyway yeah. in uh, fact i'm not i'm not uh, sure if it's still existing in uh, central europe yes or no it was quite difficult to find information about it i uh, yeah when i i think when i found this uh, the the uh, modern picture i thought it was still around um let me just uh, quickly do a search. <laughs> I will. I will tell you. But uh, yeah, I believe. Uh, I, I believe that it still exists. Uh, okay. Let me just see. It's maybe, my belief. So uh, yeah, let you search. And I mean, I think in, in general this shows also the ability of Walter Wolf as a business person, uh, because I'm not completely sure if he really uh, planned this right from the beginning. Uh, if you saw the different uh, images um, of the Walter Wolf uh, F1 car, the library is again uh, quite a me too. It copies the successful and uh, uh, loved by everybody design from the Lotus with the John Player special, a uh, complete different uh, cigarette brand. And uh, as everybody liked this design, maybe. Walter Wolf copied this a little bit uh, for his team, 
and uh, uh, up to that uh, he copied the idea that it's related to cigarettes. So first we had Lotus, uh, we had the sponsorship by Big Tobacco and uh, in uh, for Walter Wolf, it was the other way around. Uh, first, uh, they had the car design, which looked as the copy of the cigarette brand. And that's maybe he got the idea, then it's why not start my own cigarette brand looking as John Player special as Lotus is using the same colors, uh, but with my own uh, name. Yeah, so they, they still exist. So they produce, uh, Val so if you go to walterwolfworld.com, you will find that they produce herbal drops, uh, cigarettes, uh, and uh, wine. <laughs> <laughs> so not only cigarettes, but also alcohol. Uh, yeah. yeah we, by the way, you just want to say that uh, Patrick and I in no way sponsored by by, by cigarettes yes. and tobacco in, <laughs> or by anyone else. Uh, yeah. Yes. So well, if you want to sponsor us, uh, please contact us. <laughs> yes, but uh, not for cigarettes or alcohol. <laughs> that's that's definitely not acceptable. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're not getting any money from Walter Wolf, but just want yes. we just uh, we just wanted to point out that they still exist uh, and uh, yeah, the, yeah there is uh, i don't know how to buy these products but they definitely are av available at least yeah, uh, according uh, to the website <laughs> yeah I, I understand they are uh, available in central european countries like mm -hmm. for example former yugoslavia okay. and also uh, due to uh, immigration they had been available for a time in austria which would mm -hmm. also make sense because he was a born austrian but i think uh, not anymore in austria and i never saw them in any other countries to be honest mm -hmm. but nevertheless uh, if, if you see here the original blend they quite prominently put here geneva new york tokyo whatever uh, this meant at the at the time well at the time uh, you know that was quite a uh, obviously popular brand and uh, you know yeah. that's why it was on on cars but uh, yeah but i'm not sure not if it ever was available uh, really in uh, to buy in new york <laughs> Yeah, but, it, I mean, but I to be know. honest, he just put names or uh, names of cities. He's not really saying that you can buy the, the brand there. Yeah, probably. Well, they probably had offices in this in yeah. this uh, three cities. I, I I completely believe that. Yeah, yeah. let's say it, it was that way. Uh, the Walter Wolf uh, logo uh, later uh, a Swiss uh, or a Swiss citizen claimed that it, uh, he has the copyright owner. So is for that this, uh, is that slide. the most controversial slide? No, no, it's not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Uh, this is of course uh, not uh, the one. Just uh, interesting. Uh, again, the, the design of the, his logo looks reminds me very much of the. Uh, John Player special uh, logo, which had been used by um, Lotus. Uh, interesting, uh, the Italian company Alessia Perfumes uh, acquired the rights for the logo to use it for cosmetic products. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot find uh, a website for Alessia Perfumes. So my assumption is it, the company does not uh, exist uh, anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there have been some claims who are really the owners uh, of this uh, of this logo. It's honestly I couldn't really clarify this just from the internet. Mm -hmm. So just um, to mention it. Yeah. So the, the apparently there was some dispute over the copyright ownership of the uh, of the logo. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And the most controversial, at least for my Punkt, uh, uh, point of view is, of course, his uh, includement uh, in potential uh, lobbying slash uh, corruption with in a combination uh, of uh, tanks, uh, which where he was uh, investigated uh, by the uh, Austrian uh, government and uh, uh, which was uh, stopped. Uh, uh, he was also um, investigated by the Slovenian uh, government but uh, he was not uh, directly cleared of the allegation, but uh, as the investigation 
took so long uh, it uh, just uh, expired so the arrest warrant uh, and he was even even i think for some days uh, retained um, by the canadian police as he was uh, in the uh, search by by the by interpol yeah yeah mm-hmm. So, uh, and this is just one example. He had a lot of lobbying and uh, that's which thanks to his ability of networking, especially networking with a lot of important and uh, rich uh, people. Yeah, and uh, also we know that oil rich countries are not always the most, <laughs> yes. the most uncontroversial, let's just say, yeah. Yes, mostly uh, always it's somehow negatively uh, related. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so there had been uh, uh, these different uh, allegations, there had been investigations, but uh, again, uh, he never uh, had, uh, there never had been decisions, official decisions, because uh, the investigations had been uh, closed as uh, related. Uh, by the Austrian government, and I think in, for Austria, if I'm correct, it was related, more related to Texas. The ones uh, in Slovenia uh, um, expired. Uh, so I assume, uh, thanks to his budget, he also had good uh, lawyers who could uh, delay such investigations. To avoid yeah, but negative. it also depends on you know what type of involvement there was, right? We know, yeah. for example. I mean, it's not uh, it's not the same, of course, but uh, you know there are many uh, scandals with uh, investments uh, for rich people, yes. and sometimes uh, you know sometimes you don't even know what. For example, if you have your your money in mutual fund, uh, you know when no. <laughs> sometimes you don't even know what exactly is invested. I remember there was a very interesting case. Uh, with uh, Church of England, where it turned out that uh, part of the investment of the Church of England went into uh, like gambling industry. And, you know, of course, th- there was no way for, for them to know. They just contributed to a mutual fund and mutual fund invested. And of course, uh, when you are a public figure or, you know, when you are in, in public eye like that, you need to be very careful where you put your money. Uh, so yeah. it uh, it it also I think it's just uh, normally these cases are also dropped because it's just genuine lack of evidence. Otherwise, you would be convicted and uh, punished. Oh. Uh, but um, yeah, if there was if this was the case, it could also have been that you know it was kind of managed, but not necessarily authorized for you know really uh, military. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course we have, as you, as you said, there's a, always a very big gray area which makes investigations regarding lobbying, corruption, bribery very difficult. Yeah, and uh, you know we know that in some countries like United States, that's that's a legal activity. Like you can do yeah. lobbying legally. It just yes. depends yes. on what you do, right? I mean, you have to be careful about what you do, of course, and there is yeah. a lot of oversight. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's um, it. it uh, I think uh, normally such cases are dismissed on based on the basis of lack of evidence. And if there was not enough evidence, then it just wasn't pursued further. Yeah. And with this, as always, relatively at the end, uh, we have some uh, quotes. Uh, Walter Wolf, uh, besides uh, his lifestyle, uh, his preference for fast cars, he's not really a person who likes being directly uh, in the light. Not surprisingly, if you like networking with a lot of important people, you mostly are not a person who directly wants to stand uh, in the light, but somewhere, uh, I would not say uh, stand in the shadow, but uh, somewhere where not directly in, in the light. He didn't spoke a lot uh, with press, so there are very few interviews available. And that's why it explains why we just have uh, three quotes and in fact, just one from him uh, himself. Uh, because the first one is by the German uh, Canadian businessman, Karl-Heinz uh, Schreiber. 
uh, he was also somehow uh, related uh, with the mentioned uh, lobbying. He said, if you want to do a real story on Walter Wolf, this is nothing you can do in a week. Um, a good expression in uh, Canada would be, he's a strange bird. Yeah, and that's um, that's uh, actually very uh, a very telling quote, right? Uh, because uh, yeah, uh, he he did a lot of uh, very controversial stuff. If we look at it, yes. and uh, yeah, I think uh, mainly what was the problem? He was really looking for quick uh, return on his investment. And yeah. when he was not getting that, he would basically abandon the whole uh, affair. And uh, that's um, not not how the majority of teams survive in that business, right? So if we if we look at and if you if you remember what we told you about the history of Ferrari so far, and we're mm -hmm. currently, you know, we, we're about to start 1980s. Uh, in uh, sort of our progression of uh, episodes uh, on uh, uh, Formula One seasons, yeah, you would see that. Um, yeah, so the uh, the the way you win in this business is actually persevering at the mm -hmm. tasks, right, and not yeah. dropping them. And obviously, if you are in, you know, if you are just interested in money as an, you know, an opportunity for investment, then Formula One will never give you uh, guaranteed income, uh, which you can, yeah. can probably expect from some other businesses. Yeah. Um, let me uh, switch directly to the last uh, quote uh, for the moment. Uh, this comes from uh, his mother. Remember, my son, money rules the world. And this, of course, based on the experience of living in uh, financial difficult times after maybe your home, your life got uh, destroyed by uh, bombs in uh, Second World War, etc. So this is the message he got directly from uh, his parents. Of course, he experienced this uh, himself in early childhood. And uh, this... Uh, I think explains um, his his character uh, regarding networking, uh, ensuring having uh, attractive income, and maybe uh, not really considering um, uh, business ethics that much. As we saw, he had been good friends uh, of many uh, politicians from Arabian uh, countries, where we know not the most democratic regions in the world. Also, he had uh, connections with other um, country leaders, which not directly had been uh, Democrats, to say it uh, that way. So he wasn't. Uh, so he was very far away from uh, business philosophies as we know today, uh, ESG, so um, environment, sustainability, government. Uh, ensuring um, um, corporate responsibility for region community, whatever. So it was uh, quite an uh, old fashioned uh, capitalist, uh, you may say. Yeah. Yeah, I just want kind of before we go to the last quote, which is uh, very epic. Uh, so I uh, mm -hmm. kind of, in, in when my, my reading on Walter Wolf, I uh, actually found that. Uh, you know, obviously, at the time when Wolf was uh, starting in Formula One, he uh, was talking to Lamborghini a lot. And we've already told you that, you know, he was a big fan of Lamborghini and she even showed you, Patrick showed you a really great example yeah. of that. So, initial, so I read uh, 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 an interview by Walter Wolf and he was saying that initially his idea was to get Lamborghini into Formula One. And yeah. he even was trying to convince Dallara. So Dallara at the time was the main designer for Lamborghini um, to get uh, into the sport, to get into Formula One. 
But then, um, uh, if I remember that quote correctly, it was uh, so. So um, Walter Wolf was saying that uh, you know they striked uh, against me, and this is why I went and bought a piece of uh, Williams team. Um, so yeah. in in a sense that they didn't want to get into it, uh, you know, they they really resisted uh, as a uh, as a company. So Lamborghini resisted that, and that's yeah. why he kind of went with a different option. So um, so his actually ambition was to get uh, you know Lamborghini into. So he his dream was kind of to create a sort of second Ferrari in a sense, yeah. and Lamborghini definitely didn't want to do that because. They were not in the business of racing like Ferrari was. They were in the right. business of selling their luxury cars, so they had no interest in 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 uh, yes. doing Formula One. Yes, and uh, someday, uh, I mean, later on, um, Lamborghini went uh, into Formula Uno, and there's a uh, Formula mm -hmm. One, and there's a I think a great story to tell about it. The original reason why Lamborghini never went into Formula One in opposite practically to all other cars in opposite uh, from Italy, like Alfa Romeo and even uh, uh, Maserati uh, and um, Lancia is uh, directly based on Ferruccio Lamborghini uh, himself, who always uh, made it very clear that he didn't want to have Lamborghini in any kind of racing because uh, with this, he wanted to ensure that uh, his son would never get the idea to become a racing driver. So he wanted to protect uh, his son to, as we know, we discuss it in, in uh, various episodes, racing, especially in the time 50s, 70s, 80s was very dangerous. So to ensure that he never become a Formula One driver, he personally decided that the Lamborghini shouldn't enter any kind of motorsports. Yeah, and I also remember that he um, said at one point that he felt it was a mistake to get uh, James Hunt, and he, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah so I, I think he kind of like in retrospect was very regretting of that decision. And I remember again, uh, there was a very good interview with Walter Wolf when he said that, uh, well, he only took, uh, took up. Uh, um, uh, James Hunt because uh, the engineering team was insisting, the designer engineering team insisted on it. And he said that, well, that, that was a very bad, this is probably the worst decision that he made uh, in, in, in the business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would uh, agree here. Uh, I mean, uh, James Hunt and uh, Walter Wolf, I mean, that completely uh, other lifestyles and uh, uh, and of course, um, James Hunt was more at the end of the career, which many times is not really helping a small upcoming team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, uh, uh, again, I just wanted to say that yeah. um, uh, I don't have a, a good memory of that interview, but I think one of the things that uh, he said in that interview and we discussed this with Patrick a lot when we talked yeah. about James Hunt and Ronnie Peterson so yeah. when we so when Ronnie Peterson's uh, accident happened in 1979 um, James Hunt really took it to heart and really was yes. um, thinking that it was his fault and uh, Walter Wolf was in his interview was saying that okay well that James Hunt kind of got broken at that point. So it was not that he didn't want to race or, you know, didn't want to, like, he didn't uh, get the same drive out of it. He just uh, really felt very personally responsible for um, uh, Ronnie Peterson's death. And um, yeah. this, this kind of, in his words, <laughs> in Walter Wolf's words, was the reason why James Hunt couldn't do it anymore. And yeah, so that that's why also he was the bad choice because he yeah. psychologically, he just couldn't uh, win anymore. Yeah. yeah, and we discussed it in, in the mentioned special episode. I think uh, James Hunt was a very emotional uh, driver. He was not yeah, so, and so it's so Sorry, sorry, go on, go on, Patrick. Uh, just to finish, let's say maybe in opposite to uh, Nicky Lauda or Alan Prost. 
Yeah, but I mean, um, I think it's a little bit different, right, with um, uh, Nicky Lauda because Nicky Lauda kind of he he got into a position where his life yeah. was <laughs> in danger. Uh, but um, yeah, we discussed this. It's really it's really kind of amazing, right? Because we have, for example, Nina Farina who yeah. had uh, very. Uh, uh, he, he, you know, killed at one point was seven people, right? We we discussed yeah. that, and he still raced after that, and um, you know, was I, I'm not gonna say that it didn't affect him. Probably it did affect him, but he found the strength to kind of get back yes. into the driving seat and compete. Whereas, I mean, here we have um, a completely different case, right? When when. Uh, something happens on the track and you kind of think, well, you know, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that again. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, without having now a big uh, investigation on that topic, uh, maybe it's also related uh, to the times uh, Nino Farina, we are speaking about in 1950s, so 50. everybody in the 1950s uh, had a very clear um uh, 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 memory on the Second World War, meaning it was oh, yeah, 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 very, no that. very normal that people around you died. Maybe if you even have been active as a soldier, you know family members died, friends died. So death was something very natural at, at that time. So so you you accepted this uh, as a risk, maybe much more as in the 1970s, 1980s. Mm. Uh, where we luckily not have this uh, in most of the regions uh, anymore as a normal circumstance. And that's yeah. why maybe people also changed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's uh, that's probably part of it. I'm just saying, like, it's uh, quite yeah. amazing the you know the differences uh, between uh, you know the psychology of of, of different drivers yeah. and. Uh, yeah. So, but but uh, so that these were the things that I also remember he sort of was talking about yeah. at one point. I mean, Walter Wolf was talking about at one point. Yeah. yeah. And finally, yeah. <laughs> the the phrase that kind of defines I think the character very well. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh... Uh, and uh, you're completely right. I think if uh, we can resume this episode uh, to one phrase, it would be, I'm not connected, I just know people. Yeah, this was the guy who knew people, right? And uh, yeah. no matter what business that was, and, you know, he picked people very well. And, uh, yeah, he also at some point was talking about that, like, if you wanted to win, you needed to find people who can who, yeah. who won before. Or had uh, well, you know, the had the propensity of winning, and it's uh, amazing how he managed to put together, you know, these uh, sort of uh, uh, winning engineers with uh, some uh, uh, someone like Keke Rosberg, for example, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, so, so yeah, he I think he had very good intuition for people, and uh, even though you know his methods and maybe the businesses he was involved in were. Not always great choices uh, for obvious reasons, <laughs> but yeah. um, you know we can say that he. Well, one thing that uh, is uh, undisputable is that he really could choose very good people. He had yeah. the talent for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this reminds me. I think he's not uh, directly pointed out. Uh, Walter Wolf is uh, still alive. If I'm oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Is... Yeah, we were talking about his Formula <laughs> One career. Not about... he didn't die like or anything. Yeah, he's he, he's around. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, he lives uh, in uh, Canada on a, in a very nice place and uh, very uh, but without uh, contact to press or. Uh, or, so you're very uh, quite protected yeah, from he's society in, in retirement interviews. Yes, I don't know if you still somehow not, uh, still news people still connects. I I may assume yes, as you never get uh, completely retired from networking. But officially, uh, yes, uh, he looks like retired. I mean, uh, I think that probably not because, you know, he was active in the 70s and he, it yeah. was very quick uh, uh, encounter with Formula One. So I think the people who get contacted are normally people who have spent a significant amount of time. 
Uh, but yeah. yeah, he's not uh, well. He's not dead or anything. He's uh, he's uh, he's around. Uh, he's eighty two now, and yeah, uh, you know, he had a very uh, successful career in business. Yes. So, uh, uh, and even uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, it's very difficult uh, to um, put together a Formula One team and win the first race you enter, which they've yes. done, <laughs> and that's that's yeah. uh, that's very cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. That that shows you that you can organize this business well, right? Uh, and and again, we uh, with Patrick, we have this sort of conversation going on in in many episodes, whether you know it's good to be a, a, a good. Uh, expert in the field, uh, in 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 the field of, for example, uh, um, uh, you know, motorsport or, or, or car engineering, or it's better to be a, a good businessman uh, when you are, you know, when when uh, we're talking about being a team principal or, or, or being a, the the team's CEO. Yeah. So so and and in this case, we see that well. It kind of was a good thing, even though, you know, Frank Williams left, uh, then it kind of worked really well, that team, right? So when Frank Williams was managing and uh, uh, Walter Wolf was basically the, the CEO, right, who, who uh, sort of oversaw the business side. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's all for today. Yeah, so, well, thanks a lot for, for listening to us and watching us on YouTube or, or Spotify. Yeah. We are present. Uh, I already actually lost count on how many <laughs> how many different platforms. Uh, thanks to Patrick. It. Yes, uh, well, thanks to Patrick. We are present in the, in the podcast format on uh, various yeah. platforms. Thank, thank you for listening to us and uh, watching us. And I will hope to see you next time. Yep. Uh, so we had practically now two episodes on on business leaders. Last uh, time, uh, Luca Montesimolo. Today, uh, Walter Wolf. So uh, I think it was also quite interesting, not only to focus uh, on cars, on on the drivers, but also to have some of these leaders uh, in the background. And after this, uh, luckily, it's uh, time for us uh, soon to start with the 1980s, another decade. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. Very exciting. Yeah. And uh, like I said, in 1980s, we already have a little bit of uh, uh, data approach and sensor approach developing. So hopefully yes. we'll be able to show you some analysis as well, which is great. Yeah, and uh, a lot of, uh, also a lot of uh, frictions, politics in the, I remember in 1980s, so a lot to discuss. Yes, well, thanks a lot for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. See you next time.